This is the Weekly on ClickOrlando.com with Justin Warmoth. Good morning, I'm Justin Warmoth. Right now, members of Congress are away from Washington and back in their home states and districts, but following the mass shootings in El Paso and Dayton, there were calls for the Senate to reconvene with some Democratic members urging them to pass gun control legislation. This morning, Congressman Darren Soto is here to discuss what he'd like to see happen when lawmakers head back to the Capitol. And Congressman Soto, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks Appreciate for me, it. Um, all right, so let's talk about what you're doing right now. Uh, middle of August, it's the uh, district period for you. Not necessarily in recess, but uh, what are you doing uh, at home and, and uh, around the district? Well, lots of oversight meetings. I met with everyone uh, in healthcare last week, serving on energy and commerce. We work on most of the healthcare in the Congress. So, mm -hmm. meeting with Advent Health about transplants and uh, new Trump administration rules that can make that harder. We met with uh, various providers of indigent healthcare services and uh, services for the LGBTQ community, including mm -hmm. those with HIV and uh, even those pulse survivors and treating their mental health. Uh, also got out to Polk County uh, in the western part of the district to meet with local officials about potentially expanding Sunrail through Polk County to mm -hmm. the uh, Virgin Train stop that will eventually be in Lakeland. So lots going on mm -hmm. and uh, we don't stop when we get back in August. Yeah. It just means more district focused uh, time. Let me ask you this. Uh, is this a time in, in light of the recent shootings in El Paso and Dayton uh, is this a time that you wish that you were up in Congress to make something happen? So we've already passed uh, two background check bills. Right. One that closed the gun show loophole and basically require every sale to have a background check. And the second, closing the Charleston loophole where if you uh, don't get your uh, your investigation back quick enough, you don't automatically get your gun. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened in the case of Charleston where the gentleman literally put in the wrong address to get a gun through that loophole. Mm. So I think the Senate has plenty to do to just simply pass those, but there's more work to be done. Yeah. If the speaker called us back, I'd be the first one on that plane mm -hmm. uh, to deal with assault weapons and extended magazine clips, red flag laws. There's uh, work that the House could do, but uh, either way, we'll be ready to go. Right. Uh, I, I saw some calls for the Senate to go and, and reconvene. Were you behind those calls? So I support those calls, but those are also from a lot of gun rights groups and from, frankly, Americans uh, across our country. We saw in 24 hours more than 20 people dead. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it's assault weapons over and over again, and now there's a white nationalist tinge to it that we, we see getting increasingly uh, common. So, How scary is that for you? You know, we just had our active shooter training the other day in our office. Uh, we have former law enforcement who work on my staff, and uh, we work with a lot of our local law enforcement. I'm a happy-go-lucky guy. Mm -hmm. I shake everybody's hand. I talk to everybody. I'm not thinking about my own personal security because I'm a people person, mm -hmm. but I have people around me who watch out for those things. At the mm -hmm. end of the day, we still need to be accountable and accessible to our constituents and uh, have good people around us who worry about security. Mm -hmm. We're seeing more and more uh, of the white nationalist kind of uh, rhetoric coming out and, and everything like that. Is that concerning to you? Without question. You know, we're getting to be a more diverse nation, but we're also a nation that appreciates all different folks from all different cultures and races and the like. And I think uh, when you see some rhetoric coming out of uh, the president's uh, speeches where he talks about words like invasion and alien and, and calling other people rapists or, or terrible names for countries, it lowers the sensitivity we have mm -hmm. for each other and it causes some people who already harbored certain racist feelings to get supercharged and we and go and hurt people mm -hmm. and uh, obviously we have to tone down the the high uh, hateful rhetoric mm -hmm. that's going on right now and realize we have major issues in this country that we have to solve but we need to be professional while we're mm -hmm. doing it. You know, some Democratic colleagues of yours have called the president a racist. They say he is a racist. Do you believe President Trump is a racist? So I don't name call, but I can tell you he has made racist statements like telling four members of Congress, three of whom live and were raised, uh, excuse me, born in the United States to mm -hmm. go back to where they came from. Uh, and the th fourth one is a citizen uh, saying that people on both sides of the Charlottesville uh, white nationalist march were good people. Uh, and uh, denying that this kind of rhetoric is fueling some of these shooters. Mm -hmm. That, uh, those are racist statements, but I don't name call. So mm -hmm. I'll let the American public make those determinations. Let's talk about um, guns and, and what you believe would ultimately do some 
good in your eyes uh, as far as gun control measures are concerned. Is there anything that you believe needs to happen right away? Is that universal background checks? Is that one, the red flag? That's another one. But is that going to necessarily end these mass shootings? So there's multiple things that need to happen to lower these mass shootings. But let's start with those that are hugely popular and bipartisan. 90% of Americans, Democrats, Republicans, Independents, support universal background checks. We've passed that bill out of the House. It's time for the Senate mm -hmm. to act, uh, closing the Charleston loophole. So again, we don't have people who are already not allowed to have guns under the law not get them. Uh, that, again, is bipartisan and overwhelmingly possible. We could do those things. In Florida, we already passed a red flag bill yeah. for those who may be uh, threatening to be uh, to cause injury to themselves and others. It's much like our domestic violence injunctions that also allow for law enforcement uh, to take away guns under court supervision. So mm -hmm. a court has to make the decision and it's temporary. So let's bring that nationwide. And then there's the tougher issues that I do believe would at least lessen the amount of carnage that a shooter could deliver, mm -hmm. which is reinstituting the assault weapons ban. You know, we have that in place from 94 until 2004. Mm -hmm. After 2004, we saw the deaths and mass shootings triple, mm -hmm. and it may be even getting close to quadrupling now with the number of mass shootings. We don't we didn't see these headlines. We didn't see these newscasts every day about mass shootings back during that period. This is a newer mm -hmm. phenomenon over the last 10 years. Then, of course, extended magazine clips. Um, both those two things in particular, which are the hardest to do because there's less bipartisan mm -hmm. support for them, those would make sure that a, a civilian can't wield a weapon of war in a crowded area mm -hmm. and uh, take down as many people as possible as opposed to a, a handgun mm -hmm. or, or shotgun or things that are part of more personal uh, firearms that we've had in the tradition of America. Mm -hmm. We would not ban anything like that, but these weapons of war don't belong in civilian hands. We've heard Republicans say that it's not the guns, it's, it's maybe video games and, and that sort of a thing. What do you believe uh, when you hear that statement? What a cop out and an excuse. We have places like Japan and Korea which have a, f a tiny, tiny fraction of the number of deaths that we have, and they pull, that play more video games mm -hmm. and more violent video games than us. Uh, certainly it could lead to some callousness, um, but I don't think that leads to someone going out and shooting people, mm -hmm. uh, and every other country in the world hasn't had this problem. Uh, they're searching for other excuses so that they don't have to go to what is gonna need to happen, which is we need to reinstitute the uh, assault weapons ban mm -hmm. and uh, deal with extended magazine clips so that people cannot kill hundreds of people with a set of weapons on their own and uh, put our law enforcement and first mm -hmm. responders in grave danger as a result. Uh, Representative Ross Spano, uh, said this, quote, if someone wants to kill on a mass level, they don't need a weapon of the kind used in Dayton and El Paso. They can create a bomb that blows up a building or use a truck to run people over. Uh, what's your reaction to hearing that statement? So for the bombs, we actively, through the FBI and ATF and others, already have databases where we look for people making purchases of certain types of fertilizers or other things that may be used in bombs. So we're actively looking for those folks in a way that we can't at all with regard right. to assault weapons. So th that's a totally different thing. Mm -hmm. uh, with regard to a vehicle, you know, uh, everybody has to drive to work. Uh, so we, we're not gonna take people's mm -hmm. vehicles away, but that still is a more blunt uh, object to try to hurt people mm -hmm. with and it's much easier to see, but flying bullets going um, beyond sight at, at speeds that you cannot escape from, that is much mm -hmm. more dangerous. And I, and I think we can be, again, mm -hmm. we see this trend of trying to point to other things to get away from the problem, that weapons of war are killing people, including those in Pulse nightclub mm -hmm. here in Orlando and in Parkland uh, down in South Florida. Coming up, Congressman Soto will explain how the Trump administration's tariffs are affecting Florida farmers. Plus, he'll give us his thoughts on Puerto Rico. Keep it here. This is the Weekly on ClickOrlando.com with Justin Warmith. Welcome back. Members of Congress are back in their home districts this month, listening to constituents and focusing on local issues. And that includes the concerns of Florida farmers. Congressman Darren Soto is back to explain how the Trump administration's tariffs could hurt agriculture in the state. It's the whole lack of direction of the Trump administration's trade policy to begin with. 
you know, I'd be the first to say that we have to be tough on China, but have an end to it. Uh, with regard to NAFTA, you know, there's still labor provisions that mm -hmm. need to be in this NAFTA 2.0 that's been put out um, because that was the problem last time. We had jobs shipped down to Mexico. For Florida, it uniquely affects our fruits and vegetables because Mexico has the same growing season that we do, and they dump product that is state subsidized into the market mm -hmm. during this window that's traditionally um, been utilized by Florida blueberry and strawberry mm -hmm. growers and others around the end of February and March, where we're the only blueberries and strawberries in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, so we want to have the ability, just as our region, to be able to bring a case before the, the World Trade Organization. And that's not in uh, the, the NAFTA 2.0 agreement, mm -hmm. uh, the USMCO right now. So that is going to basically hurt, if not put out of business, mm -hmm. a lot of blueberry and strawberry growers and tomato growers that are in Central Florida mm -hmm. and in Tampa Bay, mm -hmm. unless they get an ability to fight dumping from Mexico. Are they concerned? Have they brought those concerns to you? Are they, under, are they aware of what could happen? This is an existential threat to them. They have come as the Farm Bureau for a whole delegation meeting just on this. But I've been briefed on this for years. Uh, when you look at uh, strawberry and blueberry growers, and particularly tomato growers, mm -hmm. have literally dwindled to less than half they were before NAFTA, and they're just hanging on mm -hmm. because they're dealing with an unfairly subsidized uh, set of growers in Mexico. And the problem is with a lot of the other growers across the United States, they're in Mexico and they're in California or in Texas and Mexico. So they don't want to bring cases. But right. Florida, we're uniquely here mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and not with operations in Mexico. And so Florida needs the ability to be able to uh, fight on their own. And that has uh, not gotten into the agreement that the Trump administration mm -hmm. has negotiated thus mm -hmm. far. I do want to ask you about Puerto Rico. Um, you know, I, I have not been able to talk to you since the last over the last three weeks, two weeks. Uh, take me through uh, your thoughts on the tension in Puerto Rico and ultimately the changing of the guard, and, and that even did not go off with uh, easily. So uh, give me your thoughts on Puerto Rico. Sure. Obviously, the people of Puerto Rico have been through so much. Yeah. My family's native island, and mm -hmm. we saw Promesa where there was huge cuts, Hurricane Maria, the longest blackout, the highest death count in modern history. And then on top of that, we see first Medicaid fraud arrest, mm -hmm. followed by this Chackate scandal, mm -hmm. 800 pages of chauvinistic uh, comments that wouldn't even be fit for a frat house, uh, let alone the governor's mansion. And uh, people were rightly already down and they felt hurt. And they rose up, mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of people to ask for the resignation of Governor Rocio. He eventually did resign, uh, obviously a big victory for uh, those people who marched uh, for days. And then there was a very strange very set of bizarre. movements uh, for governor. Uh, the governor had appointed uh, former resident commissioner mm -hmm. Per Luisi as governor, um, but then the Supreme Court held the statute that he did it under was unconstitutional because it was not uh, in line with what the Constitution says. And so it went to the next person in line mm -hmm. since there was no Secretary of State because that Secretary of State had resigned because of the Chatgate <laughs> right. scandal. So it went to the number two person in succession, uh, Wanda Vasquez, who is a bit, essentially their attorney general. They call it Secretary of Justice down there. She has assumed control as governor. You know, it's a, a tough situation she's in, but, you know, we have some good things going on. So it's important to have a a partner down there I could work with. Right. I just hope for stability and uh, for someone who's going to bring unity back to mm -hmm. the island because I have a huge bill going through Congress, bipartisan, that's going to give them $12 billion over four years to fix their Medicaid program, one that was in shambles when Hurricane Maria hit, mm -hmm. and one of the major causes of why there were so many deaths down there. That bill moved through committee with 100% Democratic and Republican support. It'll get to the floor soon, and it could really fix their health care mm -hmm. system and save lives. But I need partners I could work right. with down there. And so, trust probably too, absolutely. right? Absolutely. So I'm hoping that Governor Vasquez will be that new mm -hmm. partner along with uh, their resident commissioner, uh, Jennifer Gonzalez-Colón mm -hmm. and others. So uh, we'll see. I'm obviously apprehensive, mm -hmm. but uh, have to be open-minded on it. Yeah, I, she at first did not want the job. And, and now she has the job. So maybe her thought process has changed. I don't know if, if it has or if you know if it has. Uh, I mean, she is now the governor. So, My understanding is <laughs> with 
all the chaos and all the anger, yeah. she was a little reticent to yeah. take uh, control, especially since she didn't run for governor. She right. wasn't intending to be governor. She was the attorney general, and she wasn't even second in line. She mm -hmm. Well, she was second in line. She wasn't first in line. And so obviously that was a really big responsibility. Mm -hmm. But I almost think the fact that she wasn't actively, ambitiously seeking it is the kind of qualities we need right now, because mm -hmm. we need a caretaker for the next year and a half as uh, other candidates, not her, mm -hmm. uh, run for the governorship and the people will have a decision uh, to make on that. Um, but uh, she has assumed control. Mm -hmm. There was some speculation she may uh, resign to give it to either the resident commissioner or president of the Senate, but that's kind of settled down over the next couple of days. Mm -hmm. It's been like House of Cards, Puerto yeah. Rico style, so yeah. I've tried to follow as best I can, but it appears that she will be the governor mm -hmm. uh, for the remainder of the term unless new developments arise. Let's move on now to the uh, legislation that you have filed, right, about the state-appointed guardians. Yes. Uh, the story in itself is absolutely bizarre. It's disturbing. Um, with Rebecca Fearley, they found nine urns. Um, she did not follow orders. Tell us about this new legislation and, and what your reaction was to hearing that this sort of a thing is happening here in the state of Florida. Well, as an attorney, I've at least been tangentially a part of guardianship cases. Mm -hmm. And the guardian is there to help uh, a senior who may not have family around or may not have family who could handle a lot of their financial affairs. And they're supposed to do things in the best interest of that senior. Uh, I was mortified uh, to hear about uh, things like do not resuscitate orders mm -hmm. uh, that were signed without consent by the senior uh, and uh, the eight urns on top of it, both horrific and bizarre. Uh, we were working on trying to bring down funding and best practices uh, through a federal bill for the last couple weeks. Um, and then when this story broke, we realized it needed to be filed sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. Consider us kind of the financial support and the information support for both attorneys and for families to have a, have a database so that they can uh, look at the history of whatever guardian they're looking at mm -hmm. to take care of their loved ones, and then the funding to be able to do best management practices and other reforms. The state will be the ones who will primarily enact those reforms, and we have their backs. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is there to help prepare both them and uh, other states mm -hmm. uh, to do the necessary reforms that are gonna be needed. But just keep in mind, our population is getting older. Mm -hmm. More and more people are becoming uh, seniors, so there's gonna be a need for more and more guardians. So there's mm -hmm. needs to be more closer scrutiny, oversight, and rules of the road, and transparency. So parents, mm -hmm. uh, or excuse me, family members mm -hmm. uh, can keep track of what's happening with their loved ones and with a guardian who's there to take care of them. And also had a chance to ask Congressman Soto about the Democratic presidential candidates and their debates. Find that part of our discussion on clickorlando.com slash weekly. I'm Justin Mormuth. Have a great Sunday.